Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 293 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Holy Fire. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Every year on Holy Saturday, the day before Orthodox Easter, the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem makes a pilgrimage to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the burial place of Jesus Christ. There, amid a crowd of fellow pilgrims, he enters the tomb of Jesus and prays over the slab where the Messiah lay. He then emerges from the tomb holding two lit candles, whose fire represents the light of the resurrected Christ. He uses these to light candles being held by gathered pilgrims. Soon the church is ablaze with the lights of candles. Special emissaries from various nations also place the fire in special traveling containers. They take it back to their countries, where it is presented to religious and political leaders, and so the flame of the resurrected Christ spreads around the world. It's a moving ceremony filled with spiritual significance. But is it, as many people believe, a miracle? Does God himself light the fire? Does it have a natural source? And what can we learn about this historic rite? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we want to say to begin today's mystery? Over the last several years, I've had multiple requests to cover the mystery of the Holy Fire. Um, I was hampered for quite some time by the fact that a lot of the resources I needed to consult were not available in English. But I eventually found enough that I could do the episode, and so we're going to do it now. Since the Holy Fire appears at Easter, why are we doing this at Easter? That would seem to be a good time to do it. Uh, from a certain point of view, yes, but the Holy Fire appears on Orthodox Holy Saturday, which is the day before Orthodox Easter. Um, currently, the Catholic Easter and the Orthodox Easter tend to fall on different days, though there are efforts to change that, and church leaders in the Catholic and Orthodox churches have signaled their support for that, for finding a common day to celebrate Easter. Uh, Orthodox Patriarch Bar Bartholomew I of Constantinople has publicly favored it, and Catholic officials have as well. I'm really hoping that this happens, and we could have a common celebration of Easter again as soon as 2025. So go Team Christian Unity. But because the Holy Fire appears in an Orthodox context, and because of the sensitivities around Easter, I wanted to cover it at a different time of year, out of respect, when nobody's Easter is involved. So that's why we're doing it now, well before either the Catholic or Orthodox Easter happens this year. Is it a matter of church teaching among the Orthodox that the Holy Fire is miraculous? Not according to the research I've done. Uh, from what I've found, it appears that none of the Orthodox churches officially state that it is a miracle. In fact, it seems that they carefully avoid saying that, just like the Catholic Church carefully does not teach, for example, that the Shroud of Turin is the actual burial cloth of Jesus. These are matters on which they want to allow the faithful to have different opinions, so it may be a popular opinion that the Holy Fire is miraculous, but it is not a matter of Orthodox teaching. So where do you want to begin? At the beginning. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their purpose indeed, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. And Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. And he bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. 
they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid, his own new tomb which he had hewn in the rock. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there, and he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying, and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? This is a harmonic account of the burial of Christ drawn from all four of the Gospels, mostly Mark and John. It provides us with a number of key details about the place where today's mystery is set. For example, it records that Jesus' tomb was a new tomb. Nobody had been laid in it before. It had been constructed by Joseph of Arimathea, who intended to use it for himself, but they needed to bury Jesus quickly because the Sabbath was starting, and the tomb was right there in the same garden where the crucifixion took place, so they used it. And the tomb had been cut out of rock. We also know that Jesus' tomb was outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem at this time. We know that because John 19.20 tells us that the site of the crucifixion was near the city, so it wasn't inside it and that the tomb was in the same location as the crucifixion site, so that it would have been outside the current city walls. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus then wrapped Jesus in burial cloths, and I should mention that while I have the Shroud of Turin on the list of topics for future episodes, I'm afraid I do not plan on doing an episode on it anytime soon, because the research requirements for that episode are enormous. So I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it is. After wrapping Jesus's body, they placed it in the tomb and sealed it by rolling a large rock in front of the entrance. Later, after Mary Magdalene and the other woman, women found the tomb empty, notice that Mary says, you know, we uh, do not know where they have laid him. Uh, Peter and the beloved disciple went to the tomb and saw the burial cloths, and afterwards Mary saw two angels sitting at the head and foot of where Jesus had been laid, suggesting a kind of bench or niche where you would lay a body, as was common in tombs at the time. With that as background, let's talk about the burial site of Jesus today. Many people in the Protestant community honor a site known as the Garden Tomb. What can you tell us about that? We discussed this one recently in episode 289 on the Tomb of Christ, but just by way of reminder, we'll cover it briefly here. The Garden Tomb, also known as Gordon's Tomb, was claimed to be the tomb of Jesus by the 19th century British Major General Charles Gordon. And as the name Garden Tomb suggests, it's located in a garden area, and it is often visited by tourists, particularly by members of the Protestant community. However, despite support for this location, archaeological discoveries have revealed that it is not where Jesus was buried. In the first place, Gordon used some spurious arguments and rather wild ones to support the identification of the garden tomb, 
However, we won't be going into those here. You can check episode 289 for more information on that. Instead, I'll present a single fact that rules out the garden tomb. It is way too old. It was originally constructed in the 700s or 600s BC, whereas Jesus' tomb was newly constructed in the first century and had never been used. While a tomb constructed six or 700 years earlier certainly would have been used, so the garden tomb cannot be Jesus' actual burial site. What about the traditional site of Jesus' burial, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? That one can be where Jesus was buried, and we actually have good evidence that it is the real site. In the first place, recent archaeological excavations have shown that the site was near but outside the city walls in AD 33, so that fits. However, more to the point, the site has a well-provenanced history, meaning that we have a good chain of custody identifying it. The current Church of the Holy Sepulchre goes back to the year AD 335, which was just after the legalization of Christianity. In AD 313, Emperor Constantine and his colleague, the Emperor Licinius, uh, issued the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity a tolerated religion. Not the official religion, just a tolerated one. Afterwards, Constantine began to support Christian churches, including building them. Uh, He wanted to build one to commemorate Jesus' resurrection, so they consulted the Christian community in Jerusalem about where it should go. And the Jerusalem Christians said, oh, yeah, the uh, site of Jesus' burial and resurrection is right over there under the temple of Jupiter and Venus. This was something that had been built two centuries earlier by the emperor Hadrian. In AD 132, the Jewish people mounted a second and, again, disastrous war against the Romans. The temple had already been destroyed during the war in AD 70, uh, and after the Emperor Hadrian put down the new rebellion in AD 135, he forbade Jews from entering Jerusalem, and he rebuilt it as a Roman-style city and named it after himself. He belonged to the Aelian family, and so the city was now called Aelia Capitolina, the word Capitolina being a reference to the deity Jupiter Capitolinus. And Hadrian built a temple to Capitoline Jove and the goddess Venus right over where Jesus had been buried, so that effectively marked the spot and made it easier for the local Christians to remember where it was. So that takes us back to the year 135 in terms of when the site was being venerated by the Jerusalem Christian community as the site of Jesus' death and resurrection. And since Jesus was crucified in AD 33, that means they only had to venerate and remember the spot for a hundred years before the Romans marked it with a temple, allowing it to be excavated and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre sepulcher to be built in 335. So we have a really good chain of custody on the site indicating that it is where Jesus was buried. Like I said, you can check out episode uh, 289 for more information about that. We also have accounts of the unearthing of the site and the building of the church. The longest one is in a work called The Life of Constantine by the Christian historian Eusebius who was a contemporary of Constantine. Now, in the 330s, the Christian community in Jerusalem knew that the place of Jesus' burial was under the temple to Jupiter and Venus, but it was buried and no one had seen it in 200 years. So they didn't know if the tomb had survived down there. I mean, it might have been crushed and destroyed. Concerning Constantine, Eusebius writes... After these things, the pious emperor addressed himself to another work truly worthy of record in the province of Palestine. He judged it incumbent on him to render the blessed locality of our Savior's resurrection an object of attraction and veneration to all. He issued immediate injunctions, therefore, for the erection in that spot of a house of prayer, for it had been in time past the endeavor of impious men, or rather, let me say, of the whole race of evil spirits through their means, to consign to the darkness of oblivion that divine monument of immortality. 
This sacred cave, then, certain impious and godless persons had thought to remove entirely from the eyes of men, supposing in their folly that they thus should be able effectually to obscure the truth. Accordingly, they brought a quantity of earth from a distance with much labor and covered the entire spot. Then, having raised this to a moderate height, they paved it with stone, concealing the holy cave beneath this massive mound. Then, as though their purpose had been effectually accomplished, they prepare on this foundation a truly dreadful sepulchre of souls by building a gloomy shrine of lifeless idols to the impure spirit whom they call Venus, and offering detestable oblations therein on profane and accursed altars. For they suppose that their object could no otherwise be fully attained than by thus burying the sacred cave beneath these foul pollutions. As soon then as Constantine's commands were issued, these engines of deceit were cast down from their proud eminence to the very ground, and the dwelling places of error, with the statues and the evil spirits which they represented, were overthrown and utterly destroyed. Nor did the emperor's zeal stop here, but he gave further orders that the materials of what was thus destroyed, both stone and timber, should be removed and thrown as far from the spot as possible, and this command also was speedily executed. The emperor, however, was not satisfied with having proceeded thus far. Once more, fired with holy ardor, he directed that the ground itself should be dug up to a considerable depth, and the soil which had been polluted by the foul impurities of demon worship transported to a far distant place. This also was accomplished without delay. But as soon as the original surface of the ground beneath the covering of earth appeared, immediately, and contrary to all expectation, the venerable and hallowed monument of our Savior's resurrection was discovered. So it looks like the Christians of the first and early second century had marked the spot themselves with some kind of decorations indicating it was a site of early Christian veneration before the temple of Jupiter and Venus was put on over the spot. In any event, we have quite good evidence going back effectively to the first century that this was the site of Jesus' burial. And Constantine had the Church of the Holy Sepulchre built at that location. Since it's 1,700 years old, the Church itself has been damaged and was once even destroyed at the orders of the eccentric Caliph Hakim, but it was rebuilt and has been renovated and is still with us today. Let's talk about the name of the Church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. What does sepulchre mean? It's an old-fashioned word, and it basically means where you lay a body. So it basically means a tomb. And this was Christ's tomb, so it's a holy place, a holy sepulcher. And so it's called the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which basically means the Church of the Holy Tomb. It includes more, though, than just Jesus' tomb. You'll recall that the tomb was in the same garden where Christ was crucified on the hill Golgotha, and that's located inside the church as well. If you go up to the second level of the church, there is a chapel at the top of the hill Golgotha, where people venerate the site of the crucifixion itself. And then when you come down to the first level, there's a big open space which contains the tomb of Jesus. What they did when they were building the church was to cut away the rock around the tomb, leaving a rectangular structure that's known as the edicule. They also cut away most of the rock of Golgotha and built the chapel, though you can still see the rock of Golgotha through plastic windows that they have. And they built the church on top of both sites. It has two domes, with the larger dome above the edicule of the tomb and the smaller dome offset from the crucifixion chapel. Which Christian communion owns the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Oh, uh, here we come to a sensitive subject. There isn't a single communion that owns it. Instead, there are six communions. The three major ones are the Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, and the Armenian Apostolic Church. And there are also three minor ones. In the 19th century, the Coptic Orthodox Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and the Syriac Orthodox Church also acquired parts of the building. Together, these six communions are bound together in what's known as the status quo agreement, and to make any changes in the structure, all six have to agree. That's a problem because relations between the six churches are at times contentious, and this is one of the shames of Christendom. 
instead of the six churches harmoniously managing the site of the Savior's death and resurrection as a sign of Christian unity, they're often at odds with each other and really territorial about their own bits of the building. To give just one example, there is a ledge outside the second floor of the church, and on the ledge is what's known as the immovable ladder It apparently once belonged to a workman who was repairing the church, but it's been sitting on that ledge since at least the year 1728, or 300 years ago. We even have old-time pictures and lithographs of the church with the ladder just sitting there, and nobody dares move it because of the relationships between the six churches that won't allow that. In 1997, a Protestant Christian pulled the ladder in and hid it behind an altar, reportedly to make a point about how silly the situation was, which, frankly, I agree with. But they found the ladder, put it back, and put a grill on the window so nobody could do that again. And this is just one sign of the tensions that exist between the churches. Yeah, I've seen those tensions myself. I've been to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre a couple of times so far, and it's a very moving experience. But the six churches are very territorial, and when one of them has a service scheduled in a part of the church, they just proceed with it, even if something else is currently going on there. So I've seen a devotional service happening in one part of the church, and then Christians from another group just barge in and start a new service on top of the one that was already happening there. There have even been fights and riots between the different groups. Every few years, something happens where one group of Christians feels that it has been provoked by another one, and a fight breaks out, leaving leaving the Israeli police authorities to try to break it up. You even see priests of one community punching priests of another community in the face. So things can get quite violent. Fortunately, this isn't the norm. I mean, you know, violent by Christian standards, not Muslim standards. Nobody's killing anyone else. But fortunately, this isn't the norm. And relations between the six churches seem to be better in recent years. But these tensions are constantly simmering under the surface. And we really need to get all this sorted out and establish a better witness for Christ. Now that we have a background on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, let's talk about what happens at Easter and the reported miracle of the Holy Fire. What can you tell us? The term Holy Fire is what it's called in English. In Greek, the name for it is hagion phos, which means holy light. The Holy Fire or Holy Light appears on the day before Orthodox Easter or Orthodox Holy Saturday. And this is a big deal. Uh, People are expecting it, so the church is packed, and you can't just show up. Each of the six churches gets a certain number of tickets to distribute to its members, and you need a ticket to be allowed into the building for this event. Reportedly, every year, people try to hide in the church overnight, including 70-year-old grandmothers, but church officials or the Israeli police catch them and escort them out of the building. So on the morning of Orthodox Holy Saturday, there's a huge crowd of people waiting outside the church. At this time, the church is locked, and it takes a special person to unlock it. After the Crusaders lost control of Jerusalem, the Muslim Sultan Saladin gave the keys to the church to a Muslim family, and as part of the status quo, they still have it today. So, around 10 a.m. on Orthodox Holy Saturday, the Muslim keymaster goes to the Armenian Cathedral of St. James, and he temporarily gives the key to the Armenian Patriarch. The Armenian Patriarch then processes to the church, where he hands the key to a member of the Muslim gatekeeper family. He opens the church, and the people go inside. The Israeli police are also on hand to deal with any problems. Uh, People process into the church, and the clerics who live in its associated monasteries do so as well. Pilgrims are assigned different places uh, based on their religious affiliation. Here is YouTuber Jesus Academy describing what he saw when he first attended the ceremony. Each community gets a specific section. My friend Jeremy, who came with me to video the ceremony in 2017, said it felt like a boxing match where each country entered the church like a contestant. And now the Russians, the Syrians, 
the Egyptians. <laughs> the arrival of the Arab Christians is a special event. They enter banging drums and hyping everyone up. They chant, we are the Arab Christians. This we have been for centuries and this we shall be forevermore. Amen. It's incredibly moving seeing them in person and hearing their chants. And the Arab Christians are quite colorful and rowdy. Uh, if you watch the video of them arriving at the church, you may even see one of them brandishing a sword for some reason. There's also an inspection of the edicule that contains the tomb. The Israeli police and the Muslim keyholder enter the tomb of Christ and check for any sources of light, for matches or lighters or anything like that. After searching the tomb, they seal the doors to the edicule with beeswax, symbolizing the sealing of the tomb of Christ by the Roman guard. Then the Greek Orthodox patriarch, who is the central figure in the ritual, arrives at the church. At noon, the Greek Orthodox patriarch enters the church, leading a cadre of Greek priests. The patriarch and the priest process around the tomb three times. The patriarch is then derobed and checked for any sources of fire. The beeswax seal is broken, and the holy oil lamp is brought into the tomb and set on the bed where Christ was laid. The patriarch receives four sets of 33 candles, representing the years of Christ's life, and then enters the tomb where he recites a prayer that has been passed down to him through the centuries. The three processions around the tomb take a while, given the crowd and the solemnity, solemnity of the ceremony, and the patriarch enters the tomb at about 2 p.m. Outside the edicule, the situation is somewhat tense. All the lights of the church are extinguished and all the people are waiting in expectation. Many are praying and occasionally shouting, Christos Anesti, which means Christ is risen, or the same exclamation in their own language. Now, we need to go back and re-listen to part of that for the sake of understanding what's about to happen. The beeswax seal is broken and the holy oil lamp is brought into the tomb and set on the bed where Christ was laid. So they place a special lamp in the inner tomb and put it on the stone slab, covering the place where Jesus was laid. The Greek Orthodox patriarch then enters and prays. He's accompanied into the edicule by an Armenian official who watches what the patriarch is doing from the entry chamber of the edicule. It is at this point that the miracle reportedly occurs. Reportedly, a miraculous fire or light appears without a natural cause. This fire or light is described as blue in color. It is sometimes described as descending from heaven. It is sometimes described as, em as emerging from the stone slab. But wherever it comes from, it is be then believed to light the oil lamp that was brought in. When the light turns to fire on the lamp, the Greek patriarch lights his candles from the lamp and then lights the candles of the Armenian patriarch, who's the only other person in the tomb, although he stays in the antechamber. The Greek patriarch then emerges from the edicule and lights the candles of the waiting pilgrims. He also crosses the candles he has in order to bless the people, and he's carried around in procession. Pilgrims simultaneously begin to pass the holy fire from one to another, and soon the entire area around the edicule is ablaze with light. The light also is carried outside the church to the waiting crowd, where pilgrims who couldn't get into the church receive it. Pilgrims also take it to other local churches in Jerusalem. Emissaries place the light in special travel containers that are designed to hold it and keep it burning. They take, uh, they take it via chartered airplanes to countries around the world, where it is presented to church and state leaders. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, the jubilant pilgrims celebrate. Reportedly, when it is first lit, the fire will not burn you, so some people wave it around their faces or pass their hands through it, but eventually it begins to burn like normal fire. There is a great procession escorting some of the fire outside the church with even a, a phalanx of bagpipes present. So that is, in essence, what happens each year on Orthodox Holy Saturday in Jerusalem. When did the holy fire first begin appearing? 
Well, there have been fire-related miracles in Jerusalem reported back into pre-Christian times, actually. Uh, This isn't mentioned in the Bible, but according to the Jewish Talmud, after the Maccabees reclaimed the temple from pagans, they found only a small cruet of oil, uh, with only enough oil for a single day, but it miraculously lasted eight days. And that's one of the things that's being celebrated at Hanukkah. In Christian times, there was a fire-related miracle reported in the year 162. In his church history, Eusebius relates the story of a man named Narcissus, who was patriarch of Jerusalem at this time. Many other miracles, indeed, of Narcissus do the citizens of the community call to mind, as handed down by the brethren in succession. And among these, they relate that the following wonder was performed by him. Once, at the great all-night vigil of the Pascha, that is, on the evening of Holy Saturday, it is said that the oil failed the deacons, and that when deep despondency seized the whole multitude, thereupon Narcissus commanded those who were preparing the lights to draw water and bring it to him, that when this was no sooner said than done, he then prayed over the water and bade them pour it down into the lamps with unfeigned faith in the Lord, and that when they did this, contrary to all reason, by miraculous and divine power, its nature was changed in quality from water into oil, and that for a very long time, from that day even to ours, a little was preserved as a proof of that wonder of former days by very many of the brethren there. So this was similar to Jesus turning water into wine, only here it was water into oil. The oil was then used for lights on the evening of Holy Saturday, and Eusebius says some of the oil was preserved to his own day in the 300s. That's not the same as what what's reported to happen today. Uh, today's event is reported to involve the miraculous production of fire, not the miraculous transformation of water into oil. Uh, this is more similar to the Maccabean oil mir- miracle, but it is a fire-related miracle. There are other reports in the ensuing centuries, but the first record we have of the modern holy fire event dates from the year 867, so the ninth century, and it became a regular occurrence after that, although there was an eruption in the year 1101. At that time, the Crusaders had just gained control of the Holy Land from Muslim forces, and Latin clergy were doing the ceremonies of at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Well, in 1101, they waited for the Holy Fire to appear miraculously, but It didn't, and everyone was really disappointed. Afterwards, Baldwin I, the second king of Jerusalem, allowed Greek clergy to begin ministering in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre again, and the Holy Fire resumed. It's continued to this day, and it's a moving event for many Christians around the world. So before we move on to our faith and reason perspective, we would like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Randall B., Adam H., Philip M., Rebecca C., and Tom E. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by... DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the Holy Fire? There are two principal theories that we need to consider. First, that the Holy Fire is a genuine miracle, that the fire appears with no natural cause. And second, that it isn't actually a miracle, that the fire has a natural rather than a supernatural cause. Let's talk about the Holy Fire from the faith perspective. This is a reported miracle that occurs in an orthodox context. Does the fact that you are a Catholic mean that you're biased against it? Not at all. God loves all his children, and he can do wondrous things in any group. 
In fact, we've covered supernatural events occurring in non-Catholic contexts before on this program. In episode 44, we looked at the case of John Hendricks, the Tennessee prophet, and I concluded that even though Mr. Hendricks was a, a Protestant, there is good evidence that God had given him genuine private revelations. Similarly, in episode 283, when we looked at Our Lady of Zaytun, and even though those apparitions were occurring in a Coptic context, I concluded that there is good evidence they're genuine. So I have no problem with the idea of God performing miracles outside of Catholic circles. In fact, I'm sure he performs miracles of healing outside of Catholic circles all the time. If someone's loved one is dying from a disease and they're praying desperately to God, he may well have mercy on them and heal the person. As Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God sends his blessings on everyone, and those blessings include miracles. I'd love the Holy Fire to be a genuine miracle that occurs every year, and to figure out whether that's the case, we need to look at it from the reason perspective and see if the evidence is better explained by natural or supernatural causation. Why is the reason perspective relevant? Because miracles are less common than normal events. Most of the time, God has the normal operations of nature proceed in a regular way, and he doesn't visibly interrupt those processes very often. You know, at least he doesn't often do so in a way that's noticeable to us. When he does, we have awe and wonder, and that's what a miracle is, a noticeable interruption of the ordinary behavior of nature that inspires awe and wonder. In fact, the Latin word miraculum means wonder or marvel. As a result, whenever we're doing a paranormal investigation, we need to first consider whether natural causes, which are more common, best explain the evidence we have. And if they don't explain it, then that gives us reason to hold that a paranormal or supernatural cause may be responsible. Natural causes belong to the province of reason, and so we need to look at reported miracles from the reason perspective, which is what the, the church, in fact, does when it investigates a miracle. In the causes of saint canonizations, for example, when a miracle is reported through a saint's intercession, the first thing that they do is ask whether it could have been produced naturally. And so in the case of a healing, they bring in medical experts to examine the case and see whether any known medical causes could be responsible. Then let's look at the holy fire from the reason perspective. What evidence is there that one could appeal to in support of the claim that it is miraculous? Principally, there are two lines of evidence. Uh, first, there is the production of the light itself. This occurs in the eticule, and so here we're dependent on the testimony of people inside the structure. That would be the Greek patriarch and the Armenian priest who accompanies him. This testimony would be reinforced by the testimony of the Muslim guardian and the Israeli police who searched the eticule for sources of fire before the patriarch enters and who reportedly search him as well before he enters. The second line of evidence concerns the nature of the fire once it's produced. Reportedly, it sometimes leaps about and lights lamps or candles without first being brought into close contact with them. Further, it is initially reported to burn in such a way that it doesn't injure people, so they can wave their hands through it or put their faces in it, and it only begins burning like normal fire after a period of time, which according to some accounts, may be something like 30 minutes, and then after that, it functions like normal fire. What would an alternative naturalistic account of the holy fire be that doesn't see it as a miracle? On this view, the Greek Orthodox patriarch would have to do something in the tomb that results in him having fire through purely natural means. Uh, he then blesses the fire and brings it out to the pilgrims who distribute it. In fact, this scenario would presumably be how the ceremony of the holy fire originated. At some point, perhaps in the ninth century, the patriarch would go into the tomb and light a candle, symbolizing the light of Christ in the resurrection, which would be quite expected. There are such fire-related ceremonies with blessed candles and fires all over the Christian world. 
For example, in Western Christendom, there is what's known as the Paschal candle or Easter candle. These are blessed uh, candles that are used at Easter time. They're white and have symbols connected with Christ on them. A new Paschal candle is blessed and lit every Easter. They symbolize the light of Christ and the resurrection. Uh, They're used in the Latin Rite of the Catholic Church, as well as in Lutheran, Anglican, and Methodist churches, among others. And you'll commonly see the Paschal candle sitting in the sanctuary of your parish all year, even when it isn't being used. Don't the same churches that use Paschal candles also tend to have Easter fire ceremonies? Yes, they do. Uh, Typically, these are fires lit outside the the parish by the priest at the beginning of the Easter vigil service on the evening of Holy Saturday. In some places, the Easter fire takes the form of a huge big bonfire. Uh, The priest then lights the Paschal candle using the Easter fire and they process into the church carrying the newly lit Paschal candle from the Easter vigil service. So we have Easter fire-related rituals all over the Christian world, and it would be entirely natural for them to have one in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre going back centuries. But because the patriarch blesses the fire and consecrates it, that would lead people to think of it as a special holy fire, which it is. Then, because of how special the tomb of Jesus is, that could lead people to think of the special holy fire as wondrous fire, and over time, that could lead to a popular belief that the fire had been produced by a miracle or wonder. That it wasn't just a wonder because of its blessing and its use in this special holy place, but you know that it had actually been produced by a miracle. This wouldn't need to be a belief that the clergy encouraged people to have. It would just be a natural folk belief that arose over time. And once the folk belief was established, the clergy wouldn't want to crush people by clarifying that the fire actually had a natural origin. It was still special, blessed, holy fire. And if people believed it had a miraculous origin, it could be better to leave them undisturbed on this point. You'll recall that in the year 1101, when the Latin clergy waited for the holy fire to miraculously appear, it didn't. But when the Greek clergy were restored, it did. One way of interpreting that is the Latin clergy simply weren't informed about what was really going on in the ceremony. They had heard the miracle rumor, and so they waited for a literal miracle that didn't happen. Then, when the Greek clergy were restored, they carried out their ritual as usual, and people again concluded it was a miracle. Of course, the other way uh, to look at this would be to say that God favored the Greek clergy rather than the Latin clergy in this case, that he wouldn't do a miracle for the latter, but I think God does miracles for people of all sorts, so I'm not particularly persuaded by the latter explanation. In any event, this is the naturalistic account of how through an entire through even entirely pure motives and folk processes the idea that the holy fire is miraculous might have come about and just because we can sketch a naturalistic account of how this emerged doesn't mean that this account is true what is the what about the evidence that people would point to for this being a miraculous fire Well, let's look at the proposed evidences in reverse order uh, of what we mentioned. The first one to look at would then be the claim that the fire doesn't initially burn like normal fire. I'm afraid that, looked at critically, this one isn't very convincing. In the first place, if it's true that the fire initially burns at a lower temperature and then gets hotter, a natural explanation would be that it's burning different stuff. So there can be a purely natural explanation for this. Many of the candles are handed out to the pilgrims at the church, and maybe the candles have wicks or are coated with something that burns at a lower temperature. And then once this material has been burned through, the rest of the candles are made of normal materials and burn at higher temperatures. That's a possibility, but I don't think that's what's actually happening. If you watch videos of people putting the candles up to their faces or passing their hands through the fire, you'll see that they often aren't really getting their faces into the flame. They're getting their faces 
close to the flame and the heat on their faces may make them think they're getting their faces right into the fire, you know, especially if they have their eyes closed and they're just feeling this heat. Um, but they're not actually getting their faces into the flame, certainly not in a sustained way that lasts for several seconds. The same thing is true with their hands. They just wave their hands quickly through the flame. They don't hold it in the flame for multiple seconds. And that's a sign that this flame is behaving like normal fire. You can get close. You can get your face close to normal fire, you know, without your hair catching on fire. And you can quickly pass your hand through fire without being burned. So I think the pilgrims sincerely believe that the fire is acting in an unusual way, but it doesn't look to me like it actually is behaving unusually. What about the reports of the fire leaping and lighting lamps it wasn't brought into contact with, or people's candles spontaneously lighting without having been brought into contact with another candle? I've heard this claim, but I haven't been able to find good documentation of it. In particular, I haven't found it happening on any of the videos I've watched, and that raises a question about what could explain this report. Uh, in the case of lighting lamps, maybe the flame sometimes flares up and it could come into contact with a lamp without anyone trying to light the other lamp, and then that gets reported as a wonder. And when it comes to candles spontaneously lighting, well, that could have a natural explanation too. Now, I don't know that this is what's happening, but if candles do spontaneously light and it's not simply a rumor, there can be chemical causes for that. For example, element 15, or phosphorus, has some interesting properties. One of its principal forms, known as white phosphorus, ignites when in contact with an atmosphere containing element 8, or oxygen. So white phosphorus catches fire when it's brought into contact with air, and you can slow that process down by suspending the phosphorus in something else that takes a while to evaporate, like water. Putting phosphorus in water stops it from catching fire, but when the water evaporates, the phosphorus comes into contact with oxygen and it ignites. And water is just one possibility. You can use other things too. So if candles actually do spontaneously ignite, we have to consider the possibility that some of the candles that are handed out to pilgrims might have been treated with a phosphorus compound that causes this. In fact, that has been proposed. According to YouTuber Book of James, one of the most vocal critics today of the Holy Fire is Greek historian Michael Kalopoulos. He believes that the candles have been dipped in a white phosphorus, which, after drying for 20 or 30 minutes, will basically spontaneously combust. In 2005, Kalopoulos went on a sort of Greek Jerry Springer with a very unhappy Orthodox priest to demonstrate his theory. Here he took about five normal, everyday candles, dips them in phosphorus, and after about 20 minutes of what appears to be pretty unfriendly Greek banter, the candles miraculously burst into flame. This seems to delightfully amaze the host, while the priest is less enthused. <laughs> I should point out that there is a diversity of opinion about the holy fire in the Orthodox world, that it isn't seen by everyone in Orthodox countries as being an actual miracle. There are people from an Orthodox background who believe that the light is produced in a natural way. For example, the Greek scholar Adamantios Koraes, who lived in the 1700s and 1800s, wrote a treatise about the holy fire in which he concluded that it was natural. Similarly, Russian Orthodox bishop Porfirius Uspensky, who lived in the 1800s, also wrote that the fire was produced naturally. In fact, according to the research I've done, none of the Orthodox churches claim the fire is really miraculous. And that seems to be a folk belief rather than a church teaching. So you don't have to have your faith threatened by the idea that this might not be a miracle. The Christian faith does not depend on the holy fire being a miracle for its validity. So this is a minor issue, and people in the Orthodox world have different opinions about it.
Do you think that anyone at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is handing out candles laced with phosphorus? I'm not persuaded of that. I just note that it's a possibility that would explain candles spontaneously igniting. However, I don't have documentation that candles do spontaneously ignite. I'm aware of the claims, but I haven't found it documented on video, so this may just be a folk rumor. And without video documentation that we could use to check out the claims, we can't really use it as evidence to show that this would be that the holy fire itself would be a miracle. Then we're back to the first line of evidence, which depends on the testimony of the people in the edicule. And here we need to think critically. Uh, we need to look at this situation like any other, without being blinded by piety or devotion. Looking at the matter strictly evidentially. We are in a situation where a person goes out of sight, something happens where no one can see it, the person comes back with a fire, and we're told that a miracle occurred while he was out of sight. Taking at face value, I mean, pretend it's not the tomb of Jesus, pretend it's not the Greek patriarch of Jerusalem, pretend it's just a guy at a carnival show making exactly the same claims. Well, Taken at face value, that is not very strong evidence of a miracle. There are all kinds of ways a natural flame could have been produced while the person was out of view. At best, we would have the testimony of the people inside the edicule that the miracle happened. And under other conditions, we wouldn't give a great deal of weight to verbal testimony in a situation like this. There are too many ways in which a trick could happen. The situation is similar to that of the physical mediums of the 19th century who produced impressive physical effects at their seances, but who also insisted on working in the dark, which is to say effectively out of view. And 19th century parapsychologists regularly exposed them as frauds by implementing controls that the mediums couldn't get around. What about the fact that the edicule itself has been searched before the patriarch enters, and the fact that the patriarch himself is searched? That would be controls on the possibility of a trick being played. Well, those things do happen, and that's good. It shows, it shows that an effort is being made to eliminate possible natural causes for the fire. However, there is a question of how thorough these controls are. Are how thoroughly these controls are implemented. Uh, when the patriarch is searched, some people help him get out of his heavier ceremonial garments, but they're in the middle of a crowded group of pilgrims, and they don't have time to do a thorough body search, much less do they rifle through all of his ceremonial garments. It thus appears that this is more of a cursory examination. Does that mean that you're willing to accuse the patriarch of sneaking in a lighter or matches? No, I don't think that's what's happening. Uh, despite the cursory nature of the, of the search, I think that the patriarch isn't carrying any source of flame. Instead, there are indications that something else may be happening. So here comes our twist. In the year 2000, the British newspaper The Telegraph interviewed someone who reportedly had a relative that directly participated in the ceremony. They reported... Local Christians, a tiny minority in a holy land racked by violence, certainly need something to cheer them up. But one Armenian torchbearer, Sukias Chilingiran, felt the truth had to be told. He said, it's not a miracle. The Greek priests bring in a lamp, one that has been kept burning for 1,500 years, to produce the holy fire. For pilgrims full of faith who come from abroad, it is a fire from heaven, a true miracle. But not for us. Of course, the source of the fire is ancient and symbolic. I heard this from my father, and I think he knew the truth. For most of the year, Mr. Chillingiran is a chef living in Rains Park, southwest London. But at Easter, he's an aristocrat of Jerusalem's Armenian community and enjoys the ancient privilege of racing the fire up to the patriarch's throne. Now, the first thing to say that we need to take into account is the fact that this is hearsay. Mr. Chillingirian uh, says he heard this from his father. So it's secondhand information at least. We don't know where his father got this information. So it may have just been a rumor he heard. So this is not proof 
It's not even strongly evidential testimony. It's secondhand hearsay at best. But it is consistent with one of the things we heard earlier. The beeswax seal is broken, and the holy oil lamp is brought into the tomb and set on the bed where Christ was laid. Now, there is more to know about this lamp. It is not carried by the patriarch, but by one of his assistants, and it's a closed lamp with a sealed lid which is not open. So the lamp is not inspected to see whether it's lit. Furthermore, this is not the only lamp inside the tomb. There is also another lamp that is already inside. It is left perpetually on the slab covering where Jesus was laid, and it is kept perpetually burning. It is not allowed to go out. Due to translation issues, I haven't been able to verify which one it is with 100% certainty, but one of these light sources is referred to as the sleepless candle. And whichever it is, that fits with Mr. Chilingirian's reference to a lamp that has been kept burning for centuries and is used to produce the holy fire. Also, and this is a minor point, but the text of the prayer that the patriarch says is available. We will have a link to it. It's in Russian, but you can use an online translator if your browser doesn't already translate it for you. It's interesting that at no point in the prayer does the patriarch ask God to miraculously send down fire or otherwise create fire. Instead, he discusses the theme of light with many biblical references, but he eventually asks God to create light in our hearts in one of the refrains that he repeats several times. Lord, as that day you gave light to those sitting in the darkness and darkness of death, so today reveal your imperishable light in our hearts, so that we, enlightening and warming ourselves in faith, endlessly glorified you, one from the one of the eminence light, the light of joy. Amen. He isn't praying for light or fire to miraculously appear. Instead, he's asking for God to reveal his light in our hearts. So if a miracle occurs, it's a miracle he isn't asking for and doesn't even refer to. Then the patriarch says this, and therefore, reverently taking the light that burns unceasingly and ever brightly on this luminous tomb of yore, we teach it to those who believe in you, the true light. And we ask and implore you, all holy Lord, by the grace of your all holy and luminous tomb, to make it a gift of sanctification, to fulfill it with your divine grace and bless and sanctify those who reverently receive it. So the patriarch refers to taking the light that burns unceasingly on Christ's grave, an apparent reference to the flame constantly or sleeplessly burning over it, and using that light to teach believers about God, the true light, and praying that God makes it, the light just taken from the constantly burning light, a gift of sanctification to those who reverently receive it. This sounds like he may be lighting the holy fire with the constantly burning light that was in the tomb before he came in. And he's in there with two lamps, one that's always in there and one that's covered and that is brought in by one of the patriarch's assistants. And one of these two is never allowed to be put out. In fact, we have video evidence that these lamps are both lit, at least at the end of the ceremony. In 2018, an Armenian priest published a video of someone entering the Eticule immediately after the Holy Fire ceremony. The video shows them bringing out the covered lamp with the lid, and then the video, the videographer goes inside of the inner tomb where you can see the inextinguishable candle is still burning. Additional footage comes from the year 2008, where a videographer went inside the inner tomb before the covered lamp was removed, and you can clearly see in the darkness that both lamps are burning. So these lamps are both definitely lit, at least at the end of the ceremony. Couldn't they have both been out at the start of the ceremony? Maybe when the tomb is inspected in the morning, they temporarily put out the one that's normally kept burning all the rest of the time. 
then the miracle happened, and he later used the light to ignite the holy fire. Maybe, but I don't have any indication of that. The text of the prayer does not sound like that's what's happening, not with its reference to taking the constantly burning light. And at least from the sources I have, it appears that the Israeli authorities leave the lamp in the tomb burning, and they just assume the patriarch won't light the holy fire with it. Or maybe they assume that wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, Whether or not these two lamps have fire immediately before the holy fire appears, there are certainly people at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre who believe that the fire is produced miraculously. For example, here is a Coptic monk named Marcos who works at the Eticule. Where does the light come from? From from that, like from nowhere. Like I, I was not there inside, but like everyone like who I ever see, it's like uh, all of a sudden the light comes like as 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 a fire, uh, a blue light comes like on top of the holy tomb, and then they light the candles, and then they distribute it to everyone. And for for a certain time, it doesn't actually it doesn't burn. Really, the light doesn't burn. So Father Marcos says that the fire appears out of nowhere on top of the tomb, and then it's brought out to the people. But as a copt, Father Marcos does not participate in the holy fire ceremony from within the eticule. As he said, he was not there inside. Do we have any testimony from anyone who was permitted inside the eticule? Yes, and he's an Armenian priest named Father Samuel Akhoyan, uh, and he's the Armenian Armenian Archmandrite, or superior, of the Armenian monastery at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. As such, he has participated in the Holy Fire Ceremony multiple times, observing what the Patriarch does in the inner tomb. I mean, he goes in there, and then he observes what the Patriarch does in the inner tomb from the entry chamber of the Eticule. In 2018, he and Father Marcos went with a journalist into the inner tomb, where Father Samuel discussed the origin of the light. And fortunately, this conversation took place in English. They had a, a bundles of candles in their hand. You know? yes. We call them torches, you know. And they light their torches from the lit oil lamp on the tomb. And they go out, they distribute the light as being the holy fire. They light it from the oil lamp? They light it from the oil lamp that is put here, yes. But the belief is that the fire comes from the sky. No, we believe to miracles, but I didn't see, I've done three times. It didn't happen, the miracle. God does not perform miracles just to please people. When he is needed, God performs miracles only at that time. So Father Samuel says that God does not do miracles on command and that the three times he had partaken in the ceremony as of 2018, the holy fire was lit using the oil lamp that had been placed on the tomb, and it was not miraculous. At this point, Father Marcos strongly objected. No, I'm sorry, this is, this is a false, I'm sorry. I'm done, I'm done three times. Okay. Sir, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I don't, please don't interrupt me. Father, I'm sorry. Okay. I am responsible here. Yeah. This, is not, this is not the truth. I'm sorry. I've done it's it three not, times. Not happen, like you I've say. done three times. I, we, Patrick, and myself, I'm sorry, stop, stop the camera. No, stop, you can't, the camera. You, you can't, anyway. stop the camera. Okay. It's not the truth. Well, you haven't done it. To the Orthodox Patriarch is coming the Holy Light, and after is given to, to anyone here. Only the Orthodox Patriarch is inside the room. Anyway. The Armenians stay here. And Patriarch prays there, is coming the light by miracle, and is given to all. This is the truth. So Father Marcos, who himself had not witnessed the ceremony from inside the eticule, still maintained that the fire was produced miraculously. However, Father Samuel maintains that it was of natural origin. If people, or less, less we, less, if you're fighting inside the church, mm-hmm. how do you expect miracle to happen? You tell me. I mean, I cannot lie uh, to God. Mm-hmm. I cannot give order to God to bring the fire. So Father Samuel said that he could not lie to God, nor could he order God to bring down the fire, and that he found it unlikely that God would do a miracle in these circumstances, given the fighting in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which, as we saw earlier, could even include physical fighting 
In fact, Father Samuel acknowledges that he himself had previously taken part in physical fighting. While it may be less likely that God would regularly perform a miracle for people who sometimes get into fistfights, it wouldn't automatically rule it out. What I do have to take seriously, though, is Father Samuel's testimony of what he saw with his own eyes inside the eticule on three occasions, which was that the patriarch went in, and then the oil lamp that had been placed in the tomb was used to light the holy fire, and it was of natural rather than miraculous origin. This is eyewitness testimony from within the ceremony itself. Do we have confirmation of this from anyone besides Father Samuel? Yes. In 2019, the Greek author Dimitris Alikakos published a book titled Lutrose Peritu Hagio Photos, which means redemption concerning the holy fire. And in the book, he interviewed multiple people about the topic. One of them was the Greek Orthodox Archbishop, Archbishop Isidorus of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. And he has served as the skewophylax or keeper of the vessels who assists the patriarch by bringing the sleepless candle to the eticule on the morning of Holy Saturday. And Archbishop Isidorus said in the interview that he lit the sleepless candle using a cigarette lighter. The previous skewophylax, Archbishop Nikiforos, who served between 1984 and 1988, acknowledged that he lit the sleepless candle using matches. Alikakos also interviewed Greek Archbishop Garrison Theophanes uh, of the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre, who had himself been a candidate for patriarch in 2005. He told Alikakos that the fire was natural in origin and that it was then blessed by the patriarch. In the book, he also stated, we deceive the believers, letting them believe that it is a miracle. This is unacceptable and does not reflect well on us. Archbishop Theophanes also blamed the Catholic Crusaders for the invention of the fraud, which he says was then continued by the Orthodox Patriarchate. Although the reports of the Latin clergy being unable to produce the Holy Fire in 1101 after the Crusaders arrived— and its restoration by the Greek clergy would give one reason to question that claim. It would appear that the, that the belief was there before the Crusaders arrived, and they didn't have anything to do with its origin. They, in fact, bought into the folk idea and were unable to produce the fire themselves. However, the quotations from Archbishop Theophanes in Alikakos's book came from remarks he made the same year, in 2019, to pilgrims in front of the eticule itself. Even if you don't speak Greek, you can hear how emphatic he is on the subject. This is a clip, it's about 30 seconds long, but listen to the emphasis in his voice. <laughs> What he's saying in that passage is this. Just as the church blesses the water and it becomes holy, it blesses natural fire. It is natural fire. No fire descends from the sky. This is idolatry, compulsion. Divine grace descends invisibly. Indeed, the prayer states, Here we lit from the constantly burning fire of the Holy Sepulchre. In other words, it speaks of the sleepless candle. There is a sleepless candle in the Holy Sepulchre. In his overall remarks, Archbishop Theophanes says that the ceremony of the Holy Fire is not among the seven sacraments, neither is it part of the actual liturgy. Instead, he says it's appropriately listed among the mere ceremonies of the Orthodox Church. It's just a local ceremony, but it, it acquires extra importance because of where it's performed. He also once again blames the Crusaders for distorting the truth about the ceremony, but he says that the fire is a symbol of Christ and that it's just a natural symbol. He says that the holy fire is lit from the sleepless candle and then distributed to the people. He says, 
both the church officially and the patriarchy call it the ceremony of the holy fire. They do not call it a miracle, although it is a miracle, but in the way of the church. Fire is sanctified, and it can do miracles through faith. Not all people have the same degree of faith, but some. Maybe the Russians and the common people exaggerated a little. And sometimes we, the clergy, don't tell the truth. And an Armenian gets in, they're entitled to, and of course they spread the truth. But never mind. That's a reference to the Armenian Father Samuel's interview the previous year in 2018, in which he said the fire was naturally produced. And Archbishop Theophanes says that's the truth. Uh, He then indicates that the holy fire is lit naturally from the sleepless candle. He describes the prayer that the patriarch prays. In there, it talks about the constantly burning fire, which refers to the sleepless candle. You see, so that we know what we are talking about. As I said, the church never lies, especially when we wear the ritual vestments. Otherwise, perhaps a lack of knowledge or understanding can lead us to say anything. And it's high time people understood this. And to understand that the fire is holy, but as the church wishes. Not that the fire descends from the sky, this is idolatry. Idolaters used to do such tricks in the past. Charlatans still do, and perhaps even some clergymen. No church father concerned themselves over it, and they did not about anything else. No council concerned itself with it, therefore, can't you see? It is a local ceremony, but because it is in the Holy Sepulchre, it holds great significance. And because 10,000 people participate and are in ecstasy, They see fires light up hallucinations. He says that some of the reports of the fire doing unexplained things are hallucinations, that candles don't spontaneously light by themselves, and that it burns normally, not at a low initial temperature. In fact, he says these ideas are superstitious. These are superstitions. It could take place with the doors open a little more clearly, or the patriarchate could issue an official statement but they're afraid of scandalizing the people because not everybody can understand this. And they continue saying the same things even after you talk to them. So Archbishop Theophanes of the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre is very much of the view that the fire is natural, and he speculates on ways that the Patriarchate might let this be known in the future. Do we have any statements from the Orthodox Patriarch himself? We do have a statement from Metropolitan Bishop Cornelius Radusakis of Petra. In the year 2001, he served as surrogate of the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem. And in Alikakos' book, he confirmed that when he performed the Holy Fire Ceremony, he had a naturally burning candle. He used a naturally burning candle to ignite the Holy Fire. In a televised interview, he went on to describe the fire as natural. The prayers of the patriarch have the power to sanctify the natural fire, since there is also a fire of the supernatural. Here we are talking about natural fire, but the prayers offered by the patriarch or the bishop sanctify the natural fire, and therefore it has the grace of the holy fire. This is a natural fire that ignites from the inextinguishable lamp that is stored in the sacristy of the Church of the Resurrection. So Metropolitan Cornelius, who served as surrogate in 2001, says that the fire is natural, that it acquires the grace of the holy fire because of the prayers of the patriarch, and that it is lit from an inextinguishable candle stored in the church's sacristy. That would be the one brought into the tomb by the Scuophilax, and would be stored in the sacristy the rest of the year. So that's a pretty direct statement from a man who has performed the holy fire ceremony himself. What about the current Orthodox patriarch? Do we have any statements from him? His name is Theophilus III. Uh, One of the things pointed out in Alikakos' book was that in 2018, the official website of the Patriarchate was changed at the order of Patriarch Theophilus. Specifically, the word miracle, thauma in Greek, was removed in describing the holy fire. The IF Emerida uh, news service carried the remarks of Patriarch Theophilus when he was asked about this removal. Journalist, I recently noticed that you changed the text about the ceremony of the holy light 
on the website of the Patriarchate and replaced it with another one, which does not mention a miracle anywhere. Patriarch. Yes, that text wasn't supposed to be there. I don't know how it got in. Journalist. Yes, but the new text does not speak of a miracle. Patriarch. But the Patriarchate does not talk about a miracle. The word comes from to wonder. What can it have to do with a holy rite? So Patriarch Theophilus removed the reference on his website to the Holy Fire being a miracle. He says that the Patriarchate does not talk about this being a miracle. He points out the word's etymological meaning of just something that inspires wonder. And he refers to the Holy Fire as a mere rite, which, as we saw from Archbishop Theophanes, is distinct from the sacraments in the liturgy. So I think that this category is analogous to a sacramental or a devotion, something less than a sacrament or the liturgy, and therefore one would not expect a miracle to occur during it. I also found an English language interview with Patriarch Theophilus by the YouTuber Jesus Academy. And Jesus Academy is a big supporter of the idea that the Holy Fire is a miracle. He's got multiple videos on his channel devoted to that proposition. And in watching his interaction with Patriarch Theophilus, it looks to me like the Patriarch is trying to answer him very carefully and politely without affirming that the Holy Fire is a miracle and pointing Jesus Academy towards more fundamental matters of the faith. First, Jesus Academy asks the Patriarch what it feels like to go into the tomb pray, and see the candles light on fire. Notice that whether the fire has a natural or a supernatural cause, well, the patriarch does see the candles light on fire, so he doesn't have to challenge Jesus Academy on that. Jesus Academy then refers to this as a miracle, but the patriarch can parse this in terms of just a thing that inspires wonder, so he can get away with not challenging Jesus Academy on that either. But notice that the patriarch makes no statement that says or implies that the fire has a supernatural cause. Instead, he makes a rather understated reply. So what does it feel like to go into the tomb and pray and see the candles light on fire? to see that miracle every year? Well, uh, it's a very special and unique uh, event. And this is uh, part and parcel of the great feast of the uh, resurrection of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this um, custom is uh, one of the oldest, I mean, uh, has started from the early days of the life of the church. And uh, this uh, has been going on until uh, our days. In the video, Patriarch Theophilus looks distinctly uncomfortable answering this question. He's looking down and around and not making direct eye contact. He's speaking in a low voice, and he says that this is a special and unique thing, that it's an ancient custom, but he doesn't sound thrilled and excited about watching a genuine supernatural miracle right in front of him. Uh, Then Jesus Academy presents him with the opportunity to affirm that the holy fire goes all the way back to the Bible, that St. Peter saw it when he went into the tomb. And the patriarch says, in effect, Well, St. Peter saw the bright light, the light of Christ's resurrection, but that could be spiritual in essence rather than a literal light or fire. I read somewhere that the Apostle Peter, when he ran to the tomb, he saw the holy fire. That's true. I mean, he saw the light. He saw the light. And this is the bright light, the shining light, that uh, was the first uh, uh, sign of uh, the resurrection. So rather than affirming the holy fire as a miracle that goes all the way back to the Bible, the patriarch spiritualizes the idea and indicates that Peter didn't see the holy fire itself, but the light of Christ. 
Jesus Academy also asks the patriarch if he gets nervous the night before the ceremony. And that's a reasonable question because you might get very nervous about witnessing a miracle, especially if you were about to humanly preside over the occurrence of the miracle and millions of Orthodox Christians around the world are depending on you not to mess it up in some way. But instead, the patriarch says this. Do you get nervous the night before this great ceremony? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, on the contrary, you know, for us, uh, Easter is the uh, Alpha and Omega of uh, our faith. So the patriarch does not get nervous. Quite the contrary, he says, not nervous at all. And what's really important is Easter, meaning by implication that the holy fire ceremony is of less importance, which again doesn't sound like a miracle is happening. So what this looks like to me is that the patriarch is kind of between a rock and a hard place. He's had previous interviews in which he said that the patriarch does not describe this as a miracle and questioned what a miracle could have to do with this type of rite. One of his predecessors, the 2001 surrogate, says that the fire was natural and that it was lit by an indistinguishable lamp. And yet here he's talking to this enthusiastic guy, Jesus Academy, who was a Protestant at the time and a big believer in the miracle. And he's trying to do his best to respond truthfully, but in a way that doesn't crush the guy. And this looks to me like a microcosm of the overall situation that the patriarchate is experiencing. Trying to tell the truth about the holy fire, as in previous interviews that we quoted, but saying the truth in a way that doesn't crush the faith and devotion of people who think that it's a miracle. Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the holy fire? I would love the holy fire to be a genuine annual miracle, but the evidence does not appear to point that way. The patriarch prays in the tomb in front of two lamps, one of which has just been brought in, and the prayer refers to taking the light that burns unceasingly on Christ's grave and making it a gift of sanctification to those who receive it. We have multiple statements, both from the Armenian and Orthodox participants in the ceremony itself, that say that the lamp is lit with a lighter or matches and that the lamp is used to light the holy fire. The patriarchate, like other orthodox bodies, refuses to say this is a miracle. In fact, the current patriarch has specifically said that the patriarch does not speak of it as a miracle, and he had the word miracle removed from, the, from a text on his website saying he didn't know how that text got there. Uh, thus, it looks to me like the holy fire likely began as a typical Eastern fire ritual, just like ones all over the world. But because of the blessing of the fire and the specialness of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, a folk belief began that the blessed fire was actually miraculous in origin. Some in the Orthodox community have encouraged that belief, but current officials are trying to tell the truth about the origin of the fire in a way that still allows the Holy Fire Ceremony to be moving, spiritually uplifting, and encouraging the way it was always meant to be. Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners? We'll have links to Harris Scarlachidis' book, Holy Fire, The Miracle of the Light of the Resurrection at the Tomb of Jesus. And there's also a version of his book online. We'll have information about uh, Holy Fire, including the website holyfire.org, uh, an article on why Catholics and Orthodox might once again celebrate Easter on the same date, info about the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the Garden Tomb, the Paschal Candle, the Easter Fire, and several interviews uh, or videos by Jesus Academy, also a video by the Book of James on the Holy Fire, a Russian critique of the Holy Fire that also has English subtitles available, Israeli news video uh, interviews with Father Marcos and Father Samuel, a Telegraph article on the Holy Fire, which may be behind a paywall, and also the text of the prayer that the patriarch says at the tomb, which is in Russian, but you can use a machine translation. Very good. So that's it from us this time. What are your theories about the Holy Fire? 
You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work on this episode. They're available for hire, so if you need video and animation work, please consider them. You can see what they do by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, please do like, comment, and subscribe, because that shows YouTube you found the video engaging. And that means YouTube will think, hey, other people might find this engaging too, so I'll show it to them as well. So you can help the channel grow by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And I am trying to grow my channel. We're, we're, we're making slow progress, but it would really help if you would uh, subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified when I have a video. These days, I often have several videos a week, but I really would appreciate it. So thank you very much for subscribing. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be doing a true crime mystery. Uh, in Chicago in 1982, multiple people suddenly died by taking extra strength Tylenol that had been laced with cyanide. Nobody was ever caught and convicted for these crimes, but the authorities developed a lead suspect that they believe was responsible. We'll be telling you about the crimes and looking at who was really responsible for the 1982 Tylenol murders, or who might be responsible. Interesting. <laughs> Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at Jimmy's YouTube channel, where you should make sure to hit that bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 293. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. And by... Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. And by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>